Welcome back to 1834 Restoration House. We have taken a little break, about a week and a half, from the sewing room. And we are ready to get back to it, finish this room up. Yep. So in a previous episode, we showed you how we shellac the door and tried to get that old time finish on there by artificially aging it somewhat. You haven't really seen it in good detail. So what we've done is we propped the door up in its opening. It's not on hinges yet, but we did prop it up. I'd like to show you guys what this thing looks like. So let's go inside and have a look. Today's program is sponsored by the generous support of our patrons. Your support helps to further our historic preservation efforts. For more information, visit patreon.com forward slash 1834 Restoration House. We are so excited to get back in this room and get busy again. This is Jeannie's sewing room, and the faster we get it done, the faster she can move her stuff in here and get busy. Now, we're trying to achieve the look of old wood that's been here forever. That's what we want. We don't want it to look like it's brand new. We want it to look aged. We want it to look a little bit like it's had a history, so to speak, like people have lived here and life was lived. That's what we're after. And I think we've achieved that for the most part. So are you ready to see it? Great, let's come over here and take a look. So here's the door propped up in the frame and it has four coats of shellac on it. It's not perfect. But then these doors never were perfect in the old days because they were hand finished. But look at the color that came out of here. That is incredible. That deep, rich wood tone. I think we're going to be really happy with this. Today's project is to strip the paint off of this door frame and get this one refinished as well. That way it'll match the door and we can at least be done with that part and get the door rehung. But I'd also like to get in here if possible, if we have enough time, and strip the paint out of this closet. It looks like someone just painted it with latex at some point. I'd like to get that cleaned off and make it look like the other closet. Do you wonder what that might look like? Let's walk next door and I'll show you. This is what the closet should look like. Nice old patina of wood. That's the kind of look I'm going for because it just looks good. It's 122 years old. What more can I say about it? For Mike to start stripping the paint off of this door frame, we want to get this door latch off. It is beautiful and ornate, just like the other half of it. Isn't that incredible? We are also going to need to strip the paint off of this. Oh, nice and easy. Oh, try not to strip it. Here it's coming. That was hard to get started. Here we go. We have one method of trying to get this little screw out of here. Now this works really good with slotted screws, but not so much with Phillips head. We're gonna put that in there and we're gonna tap it and see if we can get some of that, oops some of that paint out of there so that we can get a better grip on it. Oop. Try it again. All that paint in there is making it slippery too. That looks better. Now let's try it again. Boy, it's in there tight. It's such a beautiful morning here at the Old Victorian. The sun is coming up and it's just a beautiful warm light coming in here. But that means we have to keep adjusting our camera because it keeps changing minute by minute. But we'll go ahead and get going here. This is the speed heater. And uh, a lot of you have asked about this. And, and I think that several viewers have actually purchased these for their own houses and restorations. So that's wonderful. It's a great tool. It works great. 
I'm just warming it up. It's, paint's bubbling and smoking a little bit. And then I just come in here and scrape it off like that. Real easy. No chemical stripper needed. So the way this works is we put the infrared heater real close up there. You see the paint bubbling? That means that the bond with the wood is broken. And now I can just pull and that paint comes right off. Now this is latex paint and it feels to me like there's only one coat of latex here unlike some of the other woodwork in this room. This one probably was painted latex fairly recently, maybe in the last decade or so. The thing is it works equally well whether the paint film is one coat or many coats. In fact, when you start getting multiple coats, like I'm talking like an eighth of an inch, three eighths of an inch thick, super thick, the chemical strippers have a hard time getting through that. But these will just bust right through it. All right, I'm sure you don't want to sit there and watch this all day long. So we'll get to work and then we'll come back after a while and show you what we've done. I am taking the paint off of these hinges and this toothbrush does not seem to be strong enough. This paint is harder, so we're gonna use one of these. Now, it's not brass, it's not real hard, but it is firm enough that it should help. Should do a lot more than that toothbrush. All right, that one looks done. Let's grab another one. Put the lid on. I don't want my alcohol evaporating. Those little crevices, they don't like to come out of there. It's coming off of the ball pretty nice. Well, these two turned out really, really well. Now the crevices on this top part where the ball is, that was pretty hard to get and I couldn't get it with this little tool. So I had to get a little jeweler's screwdriver. It's just a flat tip, really tiny. And I just barely pulled that out and that was it. I don't wanna scratch the whole thing up, so I'm just doing the little crevices in that. And it worked great, it's all cleaned out. The paint's gone anyway. We'll keep going and we'll come back and show you all the rest of them. We know the denatured alcohol takes off the latex layer of paint, but it's not taking off the oil-based paint. So I tried the Goo Gone and that didn't work. It took a little bit of it off, but not enough. So now we're trying turpentine. We're soaking that for several hours. And turpentine is the traditional solvent for oil-based paint. So we'll see how that works. Trial and error. I'm hoping not to have to buy paint stripper. I wanna use what I've got on hand if I can. We'll see, we may have to buy some. Oh, hey everybody, I didn't see you standing there. So I've been working on this, just trying to get the paint off and out of the crevices. Having these multiple tools works great because I can get flat spots, curves, and even down inside the cracks. So these sharp points do a really good job of taking that out. It's a lot of work, it's very slow. Once this is all finished, it'll be perfect and we can finish it with shellac. And hopefully it never gets painted again. One of the keys to using the speed heater system is these tools right here. But one of the keys to these tools right here is that they be sharp, because if they're not sharp, they don't work very well. And over the last year or so of having these things, uh, 
they kind of gotten dull because we scraped and scraped and re-scraped and, and we probably have gotten into some things like plaster dust that probably didn't help the edges any. So what I'm going to do is take these apart with a wrench and see if I can fix that. The handles are universal and the blades are interchangeable and these can be purchased from the manufacturer and uh, they have all kinds of different shapes, probably ones that we don't even have here. These are the three that came with the set and they have residue on them. So I'll just start with one and show you how this works. I have a glove. I have my denatured alcohol. I'll just get that wet. And I'm going to use this cloth to see if I can dissolve the shellac that's gotten on here. This is an important step to make sure it's completely clean because we don't want to contaminate our sharpening stones. That was taking a little bit of scrubbing to get this stuff off of here, but the, the alcohol does dissolve the shellac. That's what it's there for. But this is kind of encrusted on and it's been exposed to heat, which makes it even crustier. So I'll just keep scrubbing. Now, these tools, when they came from the factory, these were razor sharp. I mean, you could just do like that and you would cut yourself. That's what we want to see when we're done here. No, I don't want to cut myself. I just want the tools to be sharp enough to do that. Sometimes there's a little bit that won't come off. So I just take the edge of one of the other tools and just use that to very gently pop it off there. And then I'll go back and polish it up with some denatured alcohol. Now that it's completely clean and dry, I have here a stone that I picked up from a local woodworking store. And most of them have these. And it's called a sharpening stone. So I'm going to put a little bit of water on there and it should absorb that water. Okay, see how it just soaks right in there? Like magic, right before your very eyes, the water gets absorbed into the stone. And I think this stone came from, I wanna say Arkansas or something like that. It was one of the Southern states. That's amazing how it just goes right in there. So I'm just going to prime the stone up a little bit, get some water in there. And now that that's done, the bottom side is down against the stone. So I'll just rub it for a bit. And I'll keep adding water. I want to keep it wet. I don't want to sling water everywhere either, so I kind of have to give it a second. There we go. This is how woodworkers sharpen their chisels. The water going in acted like a vacuum when it, it sucks the tool down there. There it goes. Wow. That was powerful suction there. It got to where I couldn't move it. See how the stone is discoloring? It's taking bits of metal and it gets in the surface and turns it dark. So I'm going to go along here and see if I can't rub off some of this residue. Don't worry about the discoloration, that's normal. You can wipe it off if you'd like. Now let's put some more water back on there. Some people like to take their stones and soak them completely underwater for a while. The main thing is that you really don't want your stone to be dry. You want it to be wet. These stones have an amazing property where they can soak up an awful lot of water. So when you store them, you want to store them in a place where they can dry out, some place where the humidity is not going to hurt anything. Like don't stick it in your toolbox, for example. That wouldn't be good. 
So every once in a while I'm going to stop and just dry it off, wipe off any residue, and take a look and see how it is. So in cases like this where you're really not developing the edge quickly, that means that it went too long without being sharpened. So I have another technique to fix that. As I mentioned a minute ago, the way to sharpen these blades is to polish off the backside because it's flat. So you're going to polish it off and reduce the thickness by an ever so slight amount. Now, how do we do that? Well, we take our super coarse 60 grit paper that, no, no, we're not going to do that. Don't do this. This is not how you do it. So I've got 150 grit paper and it's a wet dry paper. So I'll just lay it on there and again, apply some water. You don't have to get too crazy. You just want to get it wet. And then just start going at it like this. So I've got a nice cushion of water. This is not something that's going to get done quick. So be prepared to spend some time with it. And just keep doing like this. If it dries out, go ahead and get it wet. If your paper wears out, go ahead and replace it. It's important that you have a flat surface under here. We're using a Formica tabletop. You could use practically anything as long as it's flat. We're back a couple minutes later. You can see that the water is starting to turn gray and become discolored. And that's good because that means that the sandpaper and the water are doing what they're supposed to do. They're removing microscopic amounts of metal from the back of this blade. So I'm just going to keep working at it. But let's stop and take a quick look and see where we're at. So I'll just dry this off. Now it's important that we don't leave our tools wet, of course, but during the polishing stage and, and sharpening stage, that's okay. Well, I can feel that the middle of the paper is really getting worn out. It's very smooth right here. But as I come out to the outer edge, I can feel more resistance, more roughness. So I'm going to try to use this up here as best I can, and then I'll have to change the paper. Now that the backside is flattened, I'm going to very carefully take the blade and I'm going to put the beveled edge right straight down on the paper like this. And then I'm going to just go by feel. If I rock it back and forth, I can feel where it goes flat. That's where I want to be. Now I can take my blade and just very carefully, very carefully run it on the sandpaper. I'm trying to remove just enough metal so that I can get the edge back. Okay, when I first started this, I could sight down the edge and I could see a flat spot all the way down it. And after working this thing, I no longer see the flat spot. It looks more edgy. And I can definitely feel it's catching on the skin a little bit more than it did before. It's probably not quite enough to shave with, but we're getting better. So let's put this aside. We'll grab some 320 grit paper, also wet dry paper. Get it nice and wet there. And now let's start working that edge, same way as before. And just put it in there, work it until you feel the edge goes flat on the paper, and then get to it. Well, I can definitely feel some grit happening there. So what I'm doing is I'm increasing the grit. I'm going from 150, which is somewhat coarse. I went to 320, which is finer. And in a few minutes, we'll go to 800, which is even finer yet. So by carefully working this to finer and finer grits, eventually we'll get to a point where we have a nice edge again. All right, let's take a look here. Rather take a feel. Yeah, it's definitely starting to feel like an edge is growing here. Can I shave? Mm, no, not yet. Let's go ahead and switch to 800 grit paper. The table's wet, so I want to saturate the paper and get it wet underneath so it stays down. Put some paper up on top here, and then we'll do the same thing. It's really important to find that flat spot and hold it at exactly that angle, because otherwise 
you're going to be taking metal off places you don't want to be taking it off of. All right, here we go. 800 grit wet dry paper. This is starting to feel good. And I'm seeing a little bit of darkness there in the water, which means that it's taking a combination of abrasive from the paper and metal from the blade. All right, let's take a look here, see how that feels. Yep, yep, it's definitely getting cleaned up. So let's take the 800 grit paper off and bring in the stone. We'll come back with that. Now this is going to be very critical because there's a slight curve on the face of this edge here. And so I can't just sit there and scrub it. I'm going to have to do a motion like this. And that's going to be very critical. We don't want to remove the curve. So we'll go ahead and get it wet. I'll go ahead and find the flat again. And then I'm just going to roll it back. Like this. I'm going backwards, not forwards, and not sideways. So I'm trying to draw the edge of this blade by pulling backwards on it. While at the same time, I'm rolling it back and forth like that to preserve the curve. And it's good to find that flat spot from time to time and make sure that it hasn't drifted. Now I'll go ahead and work the other edges. This would be much easier if the edges were flat and not curved, but they put a slight curve in them just so that you can use them in different scenarios as you're scraping paint. Okay, I'm starting to lose my water now. It's starting to sink in there. So I'm going to go ahead and add some more. Find the flat spot and then start pulling back on it. Now I'm going to take the blade and turn it over and polish the backside again. The reason we're doing this is because in the process of sharpening up the main edge, some of that metal will tend to curl around the back. And so what we're going to do is polish that off and that'll help us give a sharper edge. So we'll just keep doing this. Now at this point, the entire blade is already flat, so I don't have to worry about maintaining any curls. I can feel the stone grabbing, even though it's soaking wet. So I just have to get a good grip on it and keep it moving. These stones will last for years, by the way. Now we're losing the water. There went the last of it. I'm going to go ahead and just wipe that off. This thing is really covered in grit and metal dust. So I'll wipe off both sides. I'll wipe this off. That gets rid of any residue. Let's see how it feels now. Oh. Yeah, it's definitely getting to be more of an edge there way better than it was when we started. When I started this process, the blade was extremely dull. And that's my fault for not coming down here and doing this from time to time. But it is getting better. And I probably won't be able to put a factory edge on it. But at least it's way better than it was this morning. It's definitely getting sharp. Not enough to do physical bodily damage sharp, but sharp nonetheless. So let's get this thing dry. Let's see if we can cut a piece of paper with it. It doesn't cut the paper like it did when it was new, but it certainly is better than it was this morning. So I think we can do this 
Our goal is not to cut paper, but to strip paint off of woodwork. And I think we've achieved that goal. So there's one. We'll just go ahead and do the others and we should be good to go. Well, we have this blade that's been sharpened up. I can visually see with my naked eye that it's made a difference because it was literally worn flat from doing like this so much. Now it's got a blade shape and definitely feels sharper than it did. It is not sharp enough to shave my face, but I think it'll get the job done. So I've got the speed heater turned on and warmed up. Let's see what happens. So first, I'll get that hot. Wait for it to bubble. Put it on there and oh, oh, that's like when you get a brand new razor blade. That feeling that you're actually cutting something smoothly and precisely. That's what it feels like. Yes. Oh, so much better. So much better. We have been soaking this door latch in turpentine to see if we can get that oil-based paint off. It's been about four hours. Let's see if this experiment worked or not. <laughs> That is strong. Nothing. Nothing. Direct. All right, well, it looks like we will have to try another method. Turpentine did not work. Well, it's not getting the backside here either. It looks like we may have to go with paint stripper on this. This is one of our door hinges all cleaned up. Look at that beautiful color. Now that color was done on purpose when this hinge was manufactured. This is actually a copper hinge and we all know what copper looks like, but copper doesn't look like that. Now how in the world did they get that beautiful color and pattern here? Well, let me tell you a story about organ builders. So the pipe organ builders back in the old days when they would make a copper organ pipe, what they would do is they would get that pipe really hot and then they would spray it or dip it in cow urine. Yes, that's right, cow urine. And then they would pull it out and the urine would react with the copper and the heat and make this beautiful, colorful, iridescent pattern. And if you go into old churches, you might see something like that even today. But that's how they would finish this hardware, is they would get it hot, dip it into urine, pull it out, and there you have a beautiful hinge. Well, now that we know how the hinges got their beautiful color, let's go ahead and put them back on. So these are completely cleaned up, ready to go. I'm just slipping it in place. And I'll put the screws in the holes. I'll start them by hand, just because we don't want to cross thread them. The thing that I don't want to do is grab a hold of a cordless drill and just start bearing down on these things because it's really easy to cross thread if you're going into wood. It's also very easy to overdrive it. So I'm just going to take my screwdriver after they're hand started and go ahead and start running them down. And we never want to see Phillips screws in a historic house. They should always be slotted screws. Just like that. So there's one side, we'll do the other. The turpentine I was just using makes this room smell like a forest of pine trees. It smells so good. <laughs> well, Mike got the door hinges on there and it looks really, really good. I can't imagine why somebody would want to paint it. I really like it. And I love these plaster walls. They're so smooth and they turned out really, really good. I'm very happy with it. It's taken us a long time to get to that point, but <laughs> we got there and we learned a lot. So next time it won't be so difficult. I am so excited to turn this room into a sewing room. I can't wait to have the wallpaper on it and have all my sewing stuff set out and we'll take you along with us on this journey. 
I was reading your comments and it gave me an idea. So come on, I want to show you something. Well, from reading the comments, I was delighted to find out that there are a lot of diesel engine fans out there watching our channel. So I'm working on some things that I think will scratch that itch for you diesel people. So stay tuned for that coming soon. It's such an incredible time of year right now in fall. The weather is absolutely perfect. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's absolutely perfect. The leaves are starting to turn, and as you heard there a second ago, acorns are falling. But it's been great and we've enjoyed working upstairs today with the windows open and not roasting. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yes, it has. Absolutely love it. Well, thank you for watching 1834 Restoration House. If you like what you've seen, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And do leave comments. We do love to see all those comments. Yes, we do. We'll see you in the next video.